Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining me on this talk. I would like to introduce you to the German energy transition and lessons from the Helmholtz Alliance Energy Trans. First of all, let me introduce you to some physical facts on the German energy transition. We face the rapid phase out of nuclear power and a reduction of fossil energy production from 80% to under 20%. The main load of the German energy production will be carried out by volatile fluctuant energy sources such as solar and wind power. The base load will be carried out by geothermal energy and hydropower. All of this makes a significant increase in energy efficiency necessary. In 2013, the share of renewables in Germany at the energy mix was at 25%. This figure exemplifies the development of the renewable electricity production in Germany. As you can see, wind power has rapidly incre increased. Also, bioenergy has increased in the proportion of the German electricity production. The share of renewables and the extension of the German power grid are a necessity. The left map of Germany shows that the by far the largest proportion of wind power is produced in the north and in the east of Germany, whereas hydropower is produced in the south of Germany. The right hand map of Germany shows and exemplifies the corridors for the new transmission lines, the new high voltage transmission lines across Germany. The problem is that the industrial centers in Germany are located in the south and in the middle of Germany, whereas um, Wind power is produced in the north and in the northeastern part of Germany. So the extension of the German power grid is um, a necessity. This leads us to the social aspects of the German energy transition. We face large-scale financial investments and a long time frame of infrastructural planning processes. The existing energy infrastructures have to be integrated into a complex, newly developed um, smart grid and also a smart, grid, a smart meter interface. We have to link vertical and horizontal governance levels and this requires smart control mechanisms. Also, new forms of cooperation between producers and consumers, such as innovative business models and the so-called prosumers are necessary. All of these facts pose governance challenges. First of all, we face the public distrust in science. Here we perceive a gap between those who produce and apply new knowledge and those who will be affected by the positive or negative consequences of these applications. Also, there is a perceived dependency on science, on funding agencies and economic actors. Furthermore, the contested knowledge claims due to the complexity, uncertainty and also social ambiguity of the extension of the German power grid and um, the German energy transition ra gives rise to public distrust. And we also face conflicting legitimate interpretations of gathered data. Also, public distrust in politics is a major governance challenge. Here, the um, public 
has a distrust in existing institutions and governance mechanisms. The voter turnout is rather low. Also, we face a distrust in representative democracy and lobbying institutions and the lobbying structure. Also, um, there is a large frustration with the lack of involvement. All of these factors give rise to uh, the claim for more direct democracy, more direct involvement in decision making and policy making. Another governance challenge is the fragmentation of science into theoretical silos. Here the disciplinary fragmentation and the thinking inside the box is a major, are major issues. We have little truly interdisciplinary research and even less transdisciplinary research. Also, these uh, theoretical silos are inadequate for dealing with uncertainty and ambiguity in risk governance. Also, value uncertainty is a governance challenge. Here we face the question how to deal with intergenerational equity issues, social justice, and how to deal with conflictual values in plural societies. And one of the largest questions we have to settle is how to assign fair trade-offs. These governance challenges um, call for efficient and effective risk management, avoiding post-decisional regret. Also, they call for the inclusion of citizens and stakeholders, the so-called affected parties in decision-making processes. And we there is a call for the implementation of public and stakeholder participation, which is compatible with the legal framework. What we often hear is that public engagement is the solution to all of these governance challenges. So public engagement is considered a panacea to raise acceptability and overcome governance deficits. But can public uh, engagement really live up to these expectations? Let me draw your attention to some limitations of public participation. First of all, the involvement of the direct involvement of stakeholders and the public involves violates the principle of representation and democrat democratic legitimacy, at least in Germany, which is a representative democracy. Also, there is the limitation to the depth of knowledge citizens uh, can acquire in rather short time, uh, contrasting with the in-depth knowledge of agency staff and experts in their field. Also, stepping up the quantity of involvement does not enhance its quality automatically. There are also limitations of existing of the existing regulatory framework, which makes direct involvement of the public and stakeholders um, from a juristic point of view, unfeasible. Furthermore, there is the risk of frustrating people because of, due, uh, of too high expectations. Uh, also, you could talk endlessly about an issue and there really is the risk of paralysis by analysis. But contrasting with these limitations of public participation, there is the rather huge potential of public participation and stakeholder involvement. First of all, we could really improve decision making because of the inclusion of public concerns and values and put our decision making on a broader knowledge base, including local knowledge. 
Then there is the potential of enhanced acceptability of infrastructural planning and decision making. And we could enhance the social sustainability of energy infrastructures leading to uh, truly accepted decision making. But we need further research. And here I've sketched out some topics for public engagement research. First of all, we need to understand the mechanisms of how we could enhance the competence of policy making with an improved knowledge base and how to support integrative thinking by public engagement. Then uh, social learning processes could be triggered by public involvement and public engagement. We could um, gain more insights into other people's points of view and personal involvement. Here the catchphrase is citizens as the truly as the co-generators of public policy making. Also, we could enhance the transparency of the governance process and support trust in science and governing institutions. Another effect would be the accessibility or the increased accessibility of governing institutions, which would be more responsive to people's needs and preferences. Another crucial issue is how to assign trade-offs and how to come to Pareto optimal solutions. Lastly, we could enhance the adaptive capacity and coping capacity of governance institutions. And I would really look forward to the discussion after this talk and maybe this afternoon, how we could trigger research in that regard. Now I have um, thought about how the German energy transition could provide some lessons for Asia. Well, the background uh, of the German energy transition and um, energy transitions in Asia are quite different. So I would like to draw your attention to differences in modes of governance. Um, we have um, sketched out the concept, some concepts of deliberation uh, centering around the functionalist, neoliberal, deliberative, anthropological, emancipatory and postmodern concepts of deliberation. These are uh, philosophical concepts which nevertheless strongly influence our concepts and our expectations of deliberation and public engagement. And it's certainly worthwhile to reflect on uh, our basic assumptions on what goals we would like to um, achieve with stakeholder involvement and public engagement. The German energy transition is certainly uh, a novel enterprise and quite a challenge and we have uh, gained a lot of insights in how this socio-economic and socio-structural change takes place and could be supported. Nevertheless, um, the background conditions in Asia are different. And I would like to draw your attention to the fact that there are um, differences in scale and differences in socio-democratic issues. Also in Asia, lots of countries uh, can be characterized by societies of emerging markets. And the social challenges of newly industrialized countries are quite different uh, compared to um, old and established industrial countries such as Germany. Nevertheless, I think there is a large potential for 
Asian countries uh, to learn from the German energy transition. And I would like to share um, insights uh, from our research and I look forward to your comments and also, um, well, critical remarks concerning our research and how we could transfer these insights to the challenges of Asia. So thank you very much for your attention and I look forward to your questions and comments. Thank you very much.